time zones and seasons because we know there are so many countries, uh, people from so many countries uh, going to be joining us today. My name is Asti, and on behalf of the Center for Public Mental Health, uh, University of Gajah Mada in Indonesia, and the whole of the team together mental health project from Ghana, Indonesia, and the UK, we welcome you to the online preview for the Together for Mental Health project. Just a reminder uh, for the general guidelines to everyone attending this virtual event. If you are joining us in Zoom meeting room, please be sure to mute your microphone throughout all of our sessions. If we have enough time, we will cater a question and answer ses uh, session at the very end uh, of all of the screenings and speakers presentations. So please write down your question along with your name and institution and direct it to the host in the chat box. In addition to the Zoom uh, forum, we are live streaming this event via YouTube through uh, the Movie Ment YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, please someone uh, ensure that the link is provided in the chat box now for those of you who want it. And before we begin this event, let's take a moment of silence for prayers and reflections for our moment of togetherness here, but also for those who are struggling, particularly in this uh, difficult time of the pandemic. We may start for silence. Thank you everyone for taking our moment of silence. And uh, without further ado, let's begin our event uh, by first introducing our honorable chair. The man who will be taking charge for the whole proceeding is the honorable Dr. Roberto Mezzina. For those of you who have yet to know him, Dr. Roberto is a clinical psychiatrist, as well as one of the world renowned researchers in community psychiatry and global mental health. He is the former director of, uh, pardon my uh, pronunciation here, Departamento de Salute Mentale, or DSM, or the Department of Mental Health in the WHO's Collaborating Center for Research and Training in Trieste, Italy. He is also one of the strongest proponents for an empowerment uh, uh, issue for community-based care and multi-actors cooperation for mental health. So we are very, very thankful for his remarkable support throughout for our group here in Together for Mental Health and uh, as one of the great members of our international steering community. We are grateful to also have benefited from uh, your advice and support since the beginning of the project. And thank you so much for believing in us and also for bringing your uh, spirit and positivity into our uh, team. And uh, I think uh, my introduction cannot really um, explain the, the, the whole range of your work and contribution. So um, without taking much more time, please welcome Dr. Roberto Medina. The forum is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, uh, very much. Uh, I'm really honored to be here with you and uh, thank you for your very kind words. I'm, I'm just a retired psychiatrist at the moment, but <laughs> I try to work uh, uh, anyway uh, to uh, go on with the uh, uh, human rights and uh, battle for improving uh, also the uh, recovery possibilities and opportunities for people with mental health issues all around the world. So I had the uh, opportunity to work in Trieste, which uh, is an experience probably well known, uh, at least in the Western world, uh, which, which closed first, first in Europe, the psychiatric hospital replaced with the community services. So that's why I'm very pleased to introduce uh, this uh, uh, preview and, and discussion about the research together for mental health, uh, uh, where I'm uh, honored to be part of the of the uh, um, steering committee. Uh, uh, and I think it's uh, it's a great uh, opportunity with this research to explore alternative views and other kind of cultures related to mental health, the possibility to investigate using participatory methods related to the experience of people, particularly those with the lived experience and their carers, which are struggling in countries where uh, unfortunately there is not uh, a high level of support by uh, public services and uh, much of care is, um, the, the, the vast majority of care is uh, 
uh, relying still on traditional healers, which have a very important role anyway, that should be understood and integrated in a, in a wider vision, trying to change anyway, the view uh, of, mental, of mental health issues, which are uh, uh, strictly uh, linked to uh, traditional views uh, uh, and sometimes uh, leading to uh, uh, um, unfair uh, violations of human rights, which uh, uh, are understandable in a context of limited resources, but uh, uh, related to them, it's possible to find alternative solutions. So the research is exploring uh, what can happen in, in, a, in a place uh, uh, in rural areas, particularly in Ghana and Indonesia. Um, and so investigating and involving local communities and particularly people with this experience. Uh, the, it's important also to underline that the research is looking into other views related to religion and, and the impact of religions, um, Muslim religion and also Islam and also Christian religion in those countries, uh, particularly which are in a way in a complex way, interacting with local cultures and, and traditional ways of uh, treating and trying to heal people with mental health problems. Uh, also, it's important to underline that uh, both in both countries there are mental health reforms <clears throat> which are, have been undertaken recently. And also Ghana has been involved, as far as I know, in a very much important uh, 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 research and an action uh, through the World Health Organization, which is called Quality Rights Program, uh, with the training of uh, people um, uh, with lived experience, carers, and uh, mental health professionals. So, the disability rights, the human rights, and the convention rights of persons with disabilities is one of the most important framework uh, in order to overcome. But more than that, and beyond that, I think the movies are showing the creativeness, the creativity of people in finding a new solutions to uh, those very hard problems and, and the way of uh, uh, facing uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, undertaking the complexity of lives of people uh, suffering in those, in those contexts. So I think the, the research is very important. We are going to look at a, a, a couple of preview of, of clips of uh, the films done in Indonesia and in Ghana, and uh, the preliminary findings also will be presented shortly. Uh, and then there will be a discussion, I think, and uh, the involvement of all the people here. I have to introduce uh, quickly the, the great team of the research here. Uh, start with Lily Kbobi, sorry for my pronunciation, of course, which is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Psychology, University of Ghana, working in the research. She has a background in clinical psychologies and previous research experience with traditional and faith-based healing in Ghana. Diana Setiawati is the director of the Center for Public Mental Health at the Faculty of Psychology, uh, uh, University of Gajah Mada in Indonesia. Uh, and she uh, also studied in, uh, in Australia, University of Melbourne. Uh, and uh, um, she's been advocating intensely with two various research and training uh, for strengthening the mental health system uh, in Indonesia, particularly with a, a multi-level, multi-factoral approach. Uh, also, we have here Adi that we heard already, uh, pra Prastiani, uh, which is a researcher in Indonesia, uh, particularly at the Faculty of Psychology and Center for Public Mental Health too, Faculty of Psychology, at university that I mentioned before of Gadi Amada. She's a medical doctor and also medical anthropology, which is a very important point of view, very valuable for the research. Uh, and she works in, very, uh, in a wide range of topics, which includes uh, uh, universal health coverage, tobacco control, human resources for health. Then we have Wulan Nur Yatmika, uh, psychology graduate at the University of Gadi Amada, a researcher. Uh, in Indonesia. Uh, Ursula Reid uh, from the UK, which is a research associate at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at the King's College in London, UK, and uh, which is, was trained in occupational therapy and also in medical anthropology. So she, she has conducted extensive ethnographic, ethnographic research on mental, in mental health, human rights, and social inclusion in Ghana, particularly since 2005, and is co-investigator of the, uh, this research. 
Joseph Osafo is Associate Professor of Clinical and Health Psychology and Head of the Department of Psychology at the University of Ghana. has been a lead investigator in various projects in the areas of mental health, uh, suicidality, child health, maternal health, uh, and is one of the co-investigator of uh, Together for Mental Health Project. Uh, Roberta Kekle, uh, Selor May, is a clinical psychologist, uh, 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 graduate from the University of Ghana, as research assistant in this research, uh, and she's interested in treatment and care of vulnerable population. And uh, uh, last but not least, we have Erminia Colucci, Professor Erminia Colucci is his Associated Professor in Visual and Cultural Psychology at the Middle Essex University, London, and Honorary Senior Research Fellow in the Cultural and Global Mental Health Unit at the University of Melbourne. She's a clinical community psychologist and visual anthropologist and holds a PhD in cultural psychiatry. And uh, I have to uh, underline, she's uh, very passionate about prevention of uh, suicide, violations of human rights, domestic violence, and also uh, uh, um, uh, she's using uh, arts-based and visual methods in her research. She is the principal investigator of this uh, fantastic research and also filmmaker, so that can add a particular flavor to, to this uh, uh, academic activity. So this is uh, the team. I think I, I have to stop here and, and, and leave the floor to uh, particular to Armenia, which was the last I mentioned. Thank you very much. Armenia, please. Thank you so much, Roberto, for the lovely introduction. And as uh, Asti mentioned, it's fantastic having you here sharing this event. Uh, thank you for all your support for this project, also to be a good example about what we're aiming to do uh, within our own work. So thank you so much. It's a very honor to have you here. And thank you to all of you who are taking part in uh, this preview event. We are very excited. We've been uh, texting each other since last night in full excitement. Our first uh, um, preview event. So forgive us if there is anything that doesn't go uh, fully as we planned, but uh, you know, we're, done, we're doing our best. We are super, super happy to be able to finally share with you some of our findings and some part of our films. I'm going to be showing, sharing my screen now, or try to, uh, to give you an introduction um, about our project. Um, can you see my screen? Okay. If not, please let me know. Okay. Uh, so as you can see, our project, is, as uh, Roberto said, is called Together for Mental Health. And it's about using collaborative visual research methods to understand the experience of mental illness, coercion, and restraint in Ghana and Indonesia. We actually have to press this. So, uh, and if you want to tag us throughout this event in the future, our hashtag for all our social media is um, Together for MH. Uh, now, I want to just very quickly cover about what actually, um, why we're doing this project, how we're doing it, and what we're aiming to achieve, which also was mentioned already from, from Roberto before. So as many of you will know, in the past decade, human rights abuses of people with mental health issues in low-income countries have been increasingly reported uh, in many countries, including in Ghana and Indonesia. Now, both in Ghana and Indonesia have passed law ban begging the use of physical restraint on people with mental health problems. However, we know coercion practices remain unfortunately very commonplace. And mental health workers face resource challenges in carrying out community-based intervention. Now, in addition to this, despite some increased availability of mental health services, in both contexts, the traditional religious and spiritual practices remain highly valued in addressing mental health issues. Now, it has been suggested that partnership between traditional and faith-based healers and health workers could prevent human rights abuses against persons with mental health issues and enable access to treatment and better mental health care. But although there has been long-standing calls for collaboration, there has been very little investigation about how such relationship will work in practice and how to best create effective partnership between mental health workers and healers in specific location with the differing healing traditions and with different mental health systems. So our very small to achieve aim is to explore attempts made by mental health professionals, uh, workers, and to establish collaboration with faith-based and traditional healers, exactly for preventing the use of coercion and provide care for persons experiencing mental health illness. 
mental health. So uh, our specific objective are three. First of all, is about exploring and documenting social, cultural, economic, and structural factors that influence responses to mental illness, in particular uh, about decisions to use coercion and restraint. Then also exploring and documenting lived experience of mental illness and coercion and restraint, and also mental health workers and healers' attempts to collaborate to prevent the use of these measures. Our second objective is to co-develop advocacy activities and capacity building tools to prevent coercion and restraint and improving mental health care. And the lastly, uh, also developing a global south to south network with the idea of sharing experiences and best practices to reduce use of coercion and restraint and improving mental health care. And we are very excited to see that many of you join us from different countries. And we hope this preview event today will be also an opportunity for uh, us all to connect together and be part of this network. So we are very much looking forward to potentially working with uh, many of you in achieving these uh, aims and these objectives. Now, going about the how we're going to achieve this, uh, this is an, an applied interdisciplinary, representing, in fact, how the anti interdisciplinary our team is, visual research project based on the two particular methods, participatory methods and ethnographic films, both in Ghana and Indonesia. And we chose to use the visual methods because they can be very effective tools to raise awareness of mental health as well as human rights and advocating for change, which is ultimately what we, are, what we want to do with this project. In terms of ethnographic documentary, we have uh, filmed uh, field observation and interviews with people experiencing mental illness and coercion and restraint, family carers, healers, mental health workers, and other key stakeholders. We have asked for a staged consent to be able to observe, but also film the person while they're engaging in their daily activities, including also religious services and uh, other kind of healing practices. And the reason why we wanted to use also this kind of uh, documentary is because it gives access to subjective experiences without forcing any explanation. And it can be a very valuable uh, method for exploring ethically complex and multi-layered uh, topics, such as the one we are um, embracing with this project. Uh, then, uh, in terms of ethics, I'm not going to go very in depth, but obviously the ethics was very important in this project. And we used a kind of a staged consent process where people were given a quite complicated consent form, which was translated and read uh, by our, our research assistants, to be able to indicate exactly which kind of level of confidentiality and anonymity they wanted to keep. And also they could revise the decision about what to disclose about themselves and their location and what not to disclose could also be changed if they were interviewed or if they were followed in multiple occasions. Now, this was about ethnographic filmmaking, which was in Ghana, Indonesia. We were lucky to be able just in time to complete the data collection, and then we moved on to doing participatory visual methods. Again, giving a very short introduction, given our little time. Uh, the method we um, used is a, a participatory video which basically is a set of techniques aimed to involve a group or community in shaping and creating their own film. In this case, participant, which we call storyteller, produce the, their own film or films based on the issue that matter to them. And also, again, they have complete control about how they will be represented. And that's for the um, ethnographic documentary. Uh, also in this case, we chose this method because it is a very powerful means of documenting and sharing local people's experiences, their needs, as well as they hope from their own perspective, something which was very important for all of us in this project. And now we were uh, able to complete a participatory video workshop in uh, Indonesia, where we worked with 10 students of Atmajaya Catholic University, as well as 11 members of our partner organization, KPCI. We did a today's workshop, and then after a couple of months of working on the film, the students and the KPCI members uh, showed the, the film at uh, our short film festival in uh, Jakarta. Now, when we were ready to go to, to uh, Ghana, literally the week we were leaving to go in Ghana and doing the same workshop, kind of workshop sustaining filmmakers, um, uh, local filmmakers, actually, in this case, to work with people with experience. Unfortunately, COVID uh, restrictions were put in place. So we, we are unable to go to Ghana, but we are very hopeful. 2021 will be a different year, or at least we'll be able to travel more safely. And we are open to be able to complete this uh, last part of our data collection and research in, uh, in Ghana. So hopefully, we'll be able to show you more films in the future. 
Now, this project has different kind of components, different kind of outputs. Uh, as I already mentioned, the two ones um, just mentioned were ethnographic documentary film accompanied by an educational skinning guide, uh, as well as a short participatory videos and digital stories, uh, scientific publication and peer-reviewed journals, but also training materials and case studies about how can we use these kind of methodologies, particularly working with people with mental illness in low and middle income countries. Also, seminar, webinars, lectures, academic presentation, but also visual and written teaching materials for undergraduate psychology students in the different disciplines. So many, many, many things to do, and we are starting showing some of them uh, to you today. And uh, uh, what we're hoping to achieve with all these outputs is to provide evidence on the use of restraint and coercion for people with mental illness and the barriers of facilitators to collaboration between healers and mental health workers. Now, we believe this can be of use in implementation of mental health policies and practices that aim to prevent human rights abuses in this country. However, we also believe that the project outputs can also be relevant for other countries with similar practices of coercion and restraint and use of traditional faith-based healers, and therefore can also be used for public engagement, advocacy activities, teaching, capacity building in mental health in these countries too. Now, I think it's our first event, so we are beginning, you are part of this journey with us. So if you want to follow uh, what we are doing, what we're achieving, if you want to contribute to what we're aiming to achieve, uh, please join our uh, blog in movement uh, so you can receive uh, updates about any events. You can also follow us in uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, again, using the uh, hashtag together for MH as well as uh, um, our YouTube channel. So we, we hope to see many of you in, through these uh, um, vehicles. And now before I close and give the words to um, Diana to speak about Indonesia, and then I can in finally introduce you all to uh, some section of our films and some preliminary findings. There are a lot of things we have to say. We can cover everybody, but I want to make sure that we are acknowledging, uh, to begin with, the, the fund, our funding body, which is UK Economic and Social Research Council Global Challenges Research Fund, also uh, our, our institution, Middlesex University London, University of Ghana, Universitas Gajamada, King's College London, and our very important project partners, as mentioned already, Indonesia Community Care for Schizophrenia, My Freedom Ghana, Ben Pinter Tenane, Nubuka Foundation. Also, very big thanks to our advisory groups in Ghana, Indonesia, our steering committee members who are so important in this project, giving us support of different kind to what has been not a very easy uh, project, also not only for the topic, but also because of the COVID disruption. Um, our special thanks go in particular to our steering committee uh, chair, Professor Leslie Schwartz, who I hope is with us today, and uh, again to Roberto Mezzina, our beloved of the um, member who is very kindly chairing our preview event today. So thank you again, and that's ancora, uh, Roberto. Also, a very big thank you to our very committed and very patient editors, Nadia Stario from Indonesia and Anthony, Anthony Comber Badu for Ghana. And a very, very deep, deep thank you to all the people who live the experience of mental health conditions, their family, who so generously have shared their stories with us. Also, to going to more country specific acknowledgement in Indonesia, big thank you to Mental Health Directorate, Minister of Health, Republic of Indonesia, Faculty of Psychology at Majaya Catholic University, uh, Jakarta. Also, my participant in Anjur, Pondok Nurani Kamanosuyan Foundation in Jakarta, BRH Rukia Centre, Al Islami Foundation, Nurul Aromayan Islamic Boarding School in Bali, Suriani Institute for Mental Health Foundation, Ruma Badaya Community, PSN and Gases Bali Foundations, and finally in Flores, Lencheng Mose Rehabilitation Centre and Communion Order of the Catholic Church. And then uh, finally, also big thank you to staff affiliates of the Center for Public Mental Health, uh, um, University of Gajamada, for transcription, translation, graphic, and many other kind of assistance and endless support. Thank you so much to all of you. And now moving to Ghana. Also, be thank you to Dr. Akwasi Osei, Madame Priscilla Tawia at the Mental Health Authority in Ghana, the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Damian Pungure, uh, Mental Health Workers in Bono East Region, particularly George Osei, Abu Member Imani Kema, and their fantastic teams. The healers and church leaders of the congregations, particularly Nana Numufie, Nana Duodu, Prophet Kozi, Kozu, and the Holy Healings Church, and Kansa Prophet Owusu, Elder Owusu Mensa, the Reformed Christian Apostle Church in Tetishman, uh, Prophetess Teresa Popime, and the blood of Jesus Christ, 
to Bobam, Elder Elia A. Yeman, uh, who unfortunately deceased, um, and the uh, Mount Zion Paipaya camp. And then also our thanks to the workers at Peace of Christ, Operation End in End, for hosting and feeding the team during the field work. Very, very important task. And also before I close, I want to just personally give a super, super big thank you to this fantastic team in UK, Ghana, Indonesia, for all they've been doing. Uh, all of you will be uh, shortly be seeing some of the film footage, hearing some of the, uh, the results from the study, and you will see with your own eyes and hear um, uh, all the, comp the passion, the compassion, and the commitment to improve mental health care and eradicate human rights abuses against people with mental health issues. So thank you to you all. Now the word to you, Diana. Thank you, Amy. Asti, please. Hello? Yes, Ibu. Uh, and yes, thank you, Arminia, uh, for the introduction. And uh, we are going to start our presentation from Indonesia by showing you two videos. The first will be a 12-minute excerpt uh, from our film Rough Cut, and the second will be a five-minute short film that was produced from a collaboration between uh, Together for Mental Health at Majaya Catholic University and the Jakarta chapter of the Indonesian Community Care for Schizophrenia, KPSC. And following that, our uh, Indonesian co-investigator, our very own director of the Center for Public Mental Health, the University of Gajah Mada, uh, Ibu Diana Setiawati, PhD, who will present an overview about the work in Indonesia and a little about our emerging findings. So let's first enjoy an excerpt for our film Rough Cut with special thanks to our amazing editor, Nadia Asari. Uh, Ibu Diana, you. Okay, hang on. Uh, hang on. Uh. No, 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 not yet. For those in the audience who might have a little difficulty streaming with Zoom, you can also enjoy uh, the film excerpt from this link in Wistia. Uh, have you seen my screen, Basti? Not yet. Not yet, Ibu. Hang on, hang on, yeah. Oh, where is the Zoom? Uh. And I need to, sorry. Where is this? Okay, uh, I think there is something Hang on, uh, okay. Now, can you see now? Not yet, Ibu. Not yet, okay. Hang on, hang on. Sorry. Yes, you can start now, Ibu. Yeah, can you see? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Not yet, Ibu. Can you? Oh, not yet. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, uh, hang on, hang on. I don't know. If, uh, sorry for a bit technical problem. Open it. Hang on. Please bear with me. I think now you can see soon. How about now? Can you see? Yes. About, yeah. 
saya mempelajari hampir semua orang percaya kita mempunyai roh. Sehingga kita itu bisa memahami orang tidak harus melihatnya, tapi merasakan energi pun bisa. Dan dari sini kita bisa melihat bahwa pasien tidak selalu harus ditangani secara fisik, secara mental, tetapi juga dengan pendekatan spiritual ini. Uh, sebenarnya tidak bisa dipungkiri bahwa uh, pasien-pasien di gangguan jiwa ini sangat lekat dengan pengobatan tradi- pengobat tradisional. Biasanya pasien itu akan bertanya ketika kita menjalani sesi-sesi terapi, dok, uh, boleh nggak kami uh, ruyah misalnya? Biasanya saya memotivasinya begini, Wong sakit fisik saja, orang dengan penyakit fisik saja mendapatkan doa, mendapatkan dukungan ya uh, spiritual itu saja akan uh, baik gitu. Tapi tetap sesi-sesi terapi kita jalani. Kalau pasien membutuhkan obat juga obat tetap diminum rutin. Nah, ketika ketemu dengan uh, kiai atau peruk ya uh, ini. doa-doa, pikir dan sebagainya itu pasti akan uh, menguatkan itu. Nah biasanya kalau sudah saya menyampaikan bahwa tidak pernah ada yang melarang ruyah ya dan sebagainya, uh, pasien akan tanya siapa ya dok itu diantara yang mungkin dokter tahu itu yang uh, dokter rekomendasikan. Kebetulan uh, Ustaz Fadlan salah satu yang uh, saya kenal, saya pernah ber dialog lah dengan beliau ya, jadi paling tidak sudah jadi lebih paham karena beberapa kali pernah apa diskusi gitu. Gimana rasanya sekarang? Lebih lega. Ya? Lebih lega. Semua penyakit tekanan batin mempengaruhi orang lain. Maka berdoa. Berdoa dan meminta ketenangan. Eh, memang uh, seperti dengar tombo-tombo one tilu lihat tombo-tombo tidak bisa tidur ngaji lihat reng itu tombo-tombo itu jadi supaya bisa kendalikan biasanya langsung vale-vale to tombo-tombo ya sentuhan touching itu membantu membantu rupanya mungkin saraf-saraf saya juga tidak tahu gimana saya tidak bisa tapi ini misteri saya merasa bahwa sentuhan itu membantu Touch. kasih di situ saya merasa bahwa kasih Tuhan pakai tangan saya untuk mendoakan mereka Tuhan Yesus engkau menumpangkan tangan dan berkatmu mengalir atas putrimu ini ketika saya percaya bahwa kekuatan penyembuhan dari atas terjadi biasanya saya katakan oke okay, ini bisa sampai di sini tapi kalau makin berat saya umpat di dalam nama Bapa dan Amin Terima jauhlah kami dari bahaya perang penyakit dan segala kejahatan. Pandangan mereka bahwa saya akan sembuh dengan dengan berdoa, dengan melakukan acara-acara dan adat-adat spiritual. Jika terlalu tinggi, kita akan susah masuk untuk bicara tentang gejala sisofrenia. <tuh> 
obat ini bisa membuat pasien ini stabil, itu mereka tidak percaya. Harus ada medium antara yang spiritual dengan yang medis, di antara itu tuh yang kami butuhkan itu adalah para medium ini, para pastor, para pendoa, para dukun, para orang pintar di kampung-kampung, para tokoh agama, datang ke kami bersama dengan pasien, supaya kita bisa diskusi, Menurut pemahaman si Ajengan itu bahwa di diri saya itu ada jin. Nah dari situ saya tuh di Rukia. Semua santri dan ustad duduk melingkar dan saya di tengah-tengah. Dan mereka ngaji untuk saya supaya si jin di dalam tubuh saya itu menghilang. Dua minggu berobat di situ, tapi nggak sembuh-sembuh. Nah, Ustaz-Ustaz itu mereka bingung. Ini penyakit apa? Dan akhirnya si Ustaz itu minta bantuan ke pihak Yayasan Resti. Ada khas yang kami lakukan di sini adalah satu sama lain itu semua yang harus saling membantu kakak ngasuh adik sesama ODGJ tidak ada di sini perawat profesional boleh dicek tidak ada dokter yang khusus setiap hari standby mengawasi tidak ada. Merawat ODGJ adalah oleh ODGJ itu sendiri. Ini rumah keluarga. Saya ingin mencoba pendekatan yang berbeda bahwa sebenarnya ini tergantung kliennya, klien center kan. Jadi kalau dia mempercayai itu saya berusaha menggiringnya pada hal yang ramah juga. Apalagi syukur-syukur membantu untuk penyembuhannya. Tapi kalau dia tidak percaya, ya tentu saya tidak menyarankan. Jadi sebenarnya sesimpel itu, saya bukan orang, jadi soal saya kan tidak penting, soal terapisnya atau pemahaman kepercayaan, terapisnya kan tidak penting. <tuh> Dekat yang ketemu dengan dia pertama kali sudah melihat pikiran dan lain sebagainya menerawang. Apa yang bisa yang lakukan? Komunikasi yang pertama, yang ajak ngomong sehingga yang masuk pelan-pelan ke kehidupannya dia, ternyata di sana ada beban psikologis yang dialami. <tuh> Tadi sebenarnya itu sebuah prosesi upacara ritual, tetapi bahasa kerennya hipnotis supaya pikiran di bawah sadarnya, keluh kesah yang ada dalam dirinya dia luangkan dalam dua emosi tersebut. Kita tidak bisa berbicara di skala aja tanpa bantuan skala. Oleh sebab itu, yang bersihkan dulu nih loh, yang luka dia, yang mandikan dia dengan air suci dan lain sebagainya. Setelah ini berlangsung, yang lihat sudah aura uh, cakra atau dalam dirinya itu sudah mulai membaik. Baru yang akan ketemukan dengan dokter psikolog. Salah satunya adalah dokter Rai.
Barulah itu punya jiwanya dan rohnya. Ampunilah segala dosa dan kesalahannya. Sekiranya ada kejahatan atau kuasa gelapan yang menimpa dia, semoga roh yang kudus menghalau dan menghancurkan kejahatan itu, dan tangan yang maha kuasa membebaskan hamba ini dari segala kejahatan dan kuasa gelapan. Jauh orang papa dan maka roh kudus. Semoga Tuhan bersama kita. Makan kue, tidak goreng atau apa? Mana mama ya terima mama ya terima. Mama sini. Naik batu. Memang sih yang keluarga di dalam rumah. Neneknya. Ini neneknya. Terima kasih kepada ibu perawat nih. Ya sudah membantu. Obatnya. Kami juga berterima kasih karena keluarga yang kami layani juga bekerja sama dengan baik. Okay, that's the first movie, and this one is the participatory movie. Can you see now? Yeah, but Asti, can you see the? Yes, yes. Awalnya saya rasakan ketika saya kuliah di salah satu perguruan tinggi negeri di Sumatera Barat di Fakultas Sastra Jurusan Sastra Indonesia. Saat menjelang ujian akhir semester tiga, timbul suara aneh seperti suara yang mengajak bicara, menakut-nakuti menghina, dan mengejek saya. Hal tersebut menyebabkan saya mengalami kemunduran dalam belajar. Pikiran saya sibuk memikirkan suara aneh yang menimbulkan perasaan saya terganggu. Saya mempunyai cita-cita kumlot, namun karena suara-suara aneh muncul menyebabkan pikiran saya tidak dapat fokus belajar untuk mengikuti ujian akhir semester. Hal tersebut membuat pikiran saya tambah kacau balau. Saya bertemu dengan orang pintar yang sudah tua. Saya disembur air ke muka saya, dibacakan mantra, dan diberikan jimat untuk diletakkan di bantal saat saya tidur. Namun, saya semakin parah. Suara-suara aneh semakin terdengar jelas. Suara itu terus mengejek saya dan sangat mengganggu saya. Sehingga saya tidak dapat belajar. Hal itu menyebabkan saya memutuskan untuk tidak mengikuti ujian. Akhirnya, saya disarankan untuk berkonsultasi ke psikiater. Saya bercerita apa yang saya pikirkan dan rasakan. Psikiater menyuruh saya untuk mengikuti ujian dan memberikan saya obat untuk menenangkan pikiran dan kecemasan saya. Namun, saya tidak bisa menjawab soal-soal dengan baik. Karena memang saya tidak dapat belajar dengan maksimal. Hal itu menyebabkan saya stres berat dan putus asa bercampur kecewa dengan diri sendiri. Nilai IPK saya jelek. Saya depresi memikirkan nilai saya. Saya yakin cita-cita saya untuk menjadi guru besar sudah kandas. Saya frustasi dan memutuskan untuk cuti kuliah dan berobat pulang ke Jakarta. Orang tua saya pun membawa saya berobat di rumah sakit terbesar di Jakarta. Psikiater pun menjelaskan ke orang tua saya tentang semua yang saya alami dan faktor pendorong penyakit saya timbul. Dokter memberi obat dan saya harus minum obat secara rutin selama 2 tahun agar saya dapat sembuh total. Saya minum obat hanya beberapa hari saja karena merasa sudah sehat. Namun penyakit saya bertambah parah. 
perilaku saya semakin aneh, sering marah-marah, ngamuk, kadang ketakutan tidak jelas, merasa dihantui sesuatu yang menyeramkan dan aneh-aneh. Saya tidak berani keluar rumah bertemu orang banyak. Kondisi kesehatan saya semakin parah, badan semakin kurus, tidak mau makan. Hal ini karena saya mendengar suara yang meyakinkan saya bahwa makanan dan obat yang berikan dapat meracuni dan bertujuan membunuh saya. Saya selalu marah-marah kalau dikasih obat dari psikiater. Orang tua saya pun berusaha memberi obat melalui makanan dan minuman. Usaha orang tua saya membuahkan hasil. Kondisi kesehatan saya mulai membaik. Keluarga memutuskan saya dirawat inap di Rumah Sakit Umum Pemerintah di Yogyakarta. Kebetulan salah satu kakak saya tinggal dan bekerja di Jogja. Jadi ada yang mengurus saya selain ibu saya. Di rumah sakit itulah saya sadar akan pentingnya minum obat bagi penderita sizofrenia setelah saya membaca buku di perpustakaan rumah sakit. Buku tersebut menjelaskan mengenai ODS dan benar-benar mirip dengan apa yang saya alami. Beberapa minggu kemudian, saya sudah bisa rawat jalan dan pulang ke rumah. Kondisi kesehatan saya semakin membaik. Namun saya tidak boleh terlalu letih dan capek karena dapat menyebabkan saya relap. Sekarang saya mulai mengisi hari-hari saya dengan membantu orang tua saya yang mengerjakan pekerjaan rumah. Dan saya bekerja menjadi guru homeschooling untuk calistung anak kelas 2 dan kelas 3. Saya sekarang rutin kontrol ke psikiater dan teratur minum obat. Semua orang-orang terdekat saya, termasuk keluarga, mendukung pengobatan saya untuk berobat ke psikiater. Saya senang dengan pekerjaan saya sekarang. Saya belajar untuk tidak terlalu mengkhawatirkan yang belum terjadi dan lebih mendekatkan diri kepada Allah. Menurut saya, kepatuhan minum obat dan kontrol dengan psikiater sangat penting dan sangat dibutuhkan ODS agar bisa pulih. Selain itu, peranan keluarga sangat penting untuk memberikan dorongan dan kepedulian terhadap ODS. Yes, and that was the uh, short participatory film uh, co-produced by Stephanie, a psychology student from Atma Jaya Catholic University, and Siti Anissa, uh, a member of the uh, KPSI Jakarta, titled My Pain Schizophrenia, and you can watch it in uh, YouTube. And with special thanks to Ibu Angela Octavia Suryani, the Dean of Faculty of Psychology at Majaya, and Mrs. Nini Supartini for co-facilitating the workshop as well. And uh, back to you, Ibu Diana. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Asti. So that's uh, the excerpt. Yeah, of course, of course, it is very hard uh, for us to choose uh, which one of the uh, footage that we want to show yeah, because everything just very yeah, precious. So this is the Indonesia for those who don't really familiar with and uh, this one is the place where we uh, we did the the research in Cianjur. Cianjur is just close to Jakarta and Jakarta is our capital city and this one and uh, the second one is Jakarta. Jakarta is where uh, Universitas Gajah Mada uh, cited yeah and then this one is Bali maybe you uh, know Bali very well yeah, more than Indonesia, this is here. And then the, the fourth one is uh, Nusa Tenggara Timur, is Nusa Tenggara or Flores, this one, and the island names Flores. Uh, so, and other than that, we did a participatory video workshop in collaboration with Catholic University at Majaya Jakarta. And the uh, participant just now, I saw you one of the party, participatory video. And uh, from West Java, uh, the case study, uh, first case study from West Java is that you saw in the movie, Mr. 
and late 50s a family member and caregiver to her niece living with schizophrenia took the initiative after learning about horrible treatment such as passung from other psychiatric patients. So from 2015, Sarflet Residential Care Facility using donation by a local Islamic charity group who conduct visits periodically. Yeah, and uh, also uh, currently you saw in the movie that they have uh, what they call family home. Now, no professional nurse inside the care, just uh, uh, people Uh, people living with schizophrenia carrying the other something like that this one yeah you saw in the movie this one is the west java Cianjur. they care each other and then the second case is from yogyakarta bantul uh, there is a rukyah clinic founded by ustad f part of the indonesian rukyah association he was the head of indonesian rukyah Uh, association the practice is not focused on mental health cases so focus on everything but sometimes receive by client referred to him by mental health care professional so he has a he has a connection with the psychiatrist in the movie and uh, sometimes they refer each other patient and then uh, the other case is from Yogyakarta Kulon Progo there is a pesantren uh, that has always been started as a rehabilitation facility for people with severe mental illness, including drug addiction, started as a facility oriented more to Islamic healing methods. It evolved into an integrated uh, facility because they are uh, the children of the owners, uh, maybe four of them uh, become a medical doctor. Then since then, they um, uh, become a more integrated of between medical and uh, Islamic healing. Uh, so this is the place uh, where uh, the pesantren. And then the fourth case is from Yogyakarta. Uh, this one is close to each other. Yeah, uh, Originally a pesantren or Islamic school, very big, funded by an Islamic cleric, gained reputation to successfully care for a student with mental health condition. It started to be place of referral, develop personal and working relationship with one of the state of mental hospital located in a nearby city close. So they have regular travel. Uh, uh, with for patient, yeah, for patient that living there to go to the hospital to uh, for regular uh, seeing the psychiatrist. It is uh, where it is. And then uh, next we go. We went to Bali, then Pasar. The fifth case study is a network of medical, psychological, and fit based healers. Very, very nice. Involved in various degrees of collaboration for mental health issues. Dr. R, a young psychiatrist, pioneered a peer support gathering of people living with severe mental illness, introduced and connected to local Hindu religious leaders, introduced mental health perspective for future religious leaders. And then Mangkudi, Mangkudi is a progressive young Hindu religious leader, uh, regularly hot training for young aspiring uh, religious leaders has experience living with mental illness, also runs and leads religious rituals. And then Dr. K, a scholar of Balinese Hindu culture, a religious leader, leads a performing and visual art community for religious ritual services, also receive people for consultation. Dr. D, clinical transpersonal psychologist, this is the other psychologist other than uh, Dr. K, Dr. K and provide spiritual healing. So uh, this is a very nice uh, collaboration between psychiatrists, uh, uh, cultural expert and also the culture uh, leaders. And then, um, yeah, and then the psychiatrists, uh, psychologists. Uh, the sixth case study from Bali is Prof. S, uh, very senior psychiatrist, combine her psychiatric at practice with her brand of approach to spirituality. Uh, you saw the meditation in the movie. Yeah, and then uh, we move to Flores, Ruteng Manggarai. Uh, the seven case studies uh, from RM, RRM is a residential rehabilitation care for mental illness started by the Caritas Order 
of the Roman Catholic Church. Dr. R.S. Young General Practitioner born and raised in Manggarai with experience practicing in a Jakarta Mental Hospital head of the facility. And then Bruder H, Bruder J, Indonesian brother of the Caritas Order, trained in psychiatric nursing in Belgium. So become a psychiatric nurse, uh, taking care of them in the residential rehabilitation care for mental illness in uh, Manggarai. This is the, yeah, this, uh, the place where, and then the seven case studies from Maumere, Sika, so it is a bit farther east, yeah. Uh, Chameleon Order, a special mission for healthcare. Father Al and Father An, Indonesian Chameleon priests, running a seminary, networking with local health professional, initiative for passing release, um, making safe house. You saw in the movie just now that there is a, a, a a small house that very secure, yeah, and uh, they make it uh, to to free people from Pasung and put this uh, in the safe house like that, like this, this one, this the safe house, yeah. And the preliminary themes that we uh, uh, yeah we gather from the data analysis is that form of collaboration between uh, the spiritual healer and mental health system or mental health professional is uh, yeah, embodiment of integrated approach in person, referral relationship, direction of referral, health system or outreach, uh, filtering, nego negotiating of approach. And then the second theme is facilitating factors to collaboration is mutual recognition of roles, negotiation and compromise, equality uh, view, yeah, networking and leadership, differentiation between spiritual experience and mental health symptom yeah and uh, some we surprised that some of spiritual healers uh, understand that very well and then transition phase cognitive resonance and then uh, the third uh, theme is symbolism of healing symbolic interaction with rituals and symbolic interaction with water across the faith that's very interesting Okay, uh, that's uh, the, the preliminary uh, result from our research in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Maybe I return to Roberto. Okay, thank you very much. It was fantastic. I think this very much uh, in depth. Uh, so thank you for the team in uh, Indonesia. Now it's time to uh, uh, introduce Ghana film clip and summary of uh, the preliminary findings. So Lily, I think Lily will talk about it. Please, Lily. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. It's, it's really exciting for all of us to have you see the, the fruits of our labor the last couple of years. Um, we will show a little uh, clip of the, the Ghana film, the rough cuts that we've got so far. As Erminia explained, we haven't been able to do the um, participatory videos quite yet because of the COVID situation. But we will, we will discuss a little bit about what the next steps are also later and, and give the chance for some suggestions as well. So I would um, hand over to Ursula now for her to share the screen for the film. And then I'll come back in and summarize some of our findings. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Um, yes, okay. So we are going to hope that we have um, um, that this system works okay. Open. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen shortly. I will also paste uh, the um, YouTube link so that in case any difficulties we can um you can watch it there so i'll just copy that into the chat so if there's any difficulty please um you can also see it here so i'm going to share my screen now and hopefully it, it will work okay mm -hmm.
Can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah. Since you're not meaning, this is how it work. So the time they say case, normally because I, I make sure that every, every month, at least every month, I go around and we have established rapport with them. Uh, the mental authority and the regional political center organize workshop for such people. So because of this, you have good collaboration with them. Anytime they have a case, to ask the judge. This day, this is not happening. So where should this person go? And this is the program. So we give the direction. We'll go to the center or we'll go to central leaders. And one thing is we try to communicate the feedback to them. and face-based centers in Tejima Municipal. Number of them, if I would say about five of them, and then two of them are inactive. So we basically had two, Reformed Christian Apostolic Church, and then the other one, Continuation Church. When it started is when about three years ago that the collaboration started becoming strong. They allowed us to come here as part of our outreach activities, and then they do bring all of a sudden, they do bring their patient to our outreach for treatment. So we do come, we give treatment here. Sometimes we do even see acute cases here. Now we had a special arrangement with the social welfare team and the municipal health directorate. We had names of those patients they see with that insurance. Then they were all insured for free as indigents. It was positive for us. I think that was the way forward that we started collaborating with them.
Doctors <laughs> Then the young from the let's say a ton that from my own bear on them from a deal. For who are crying now? Now, one minute. And the other would just anybody know what they fear. I said, one minute in the phone or from Doctor, but with my daughter, quantity, quantity, the password, which may be now quantity, the password, which may add that our own hygiene, quantity, the password, a be a way of a call. In my idea, this afternoon, the free doctor's name and chain. Medical <laughs> This one in your hospital alive. It's because if you are not going to come for it. Mark and still in eternity. If you are not spiritual, you are not just a problem. You pray as an abu, dear, mighty dear, and I'm not going to come for it. My child had for me 36 years. And then, friends, Mr. Tejman, leave back up. So only down here, no one here. Can you can you understand? 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 Can you in two, I see it. The Masuma, the JDM, the Jonaso, I support the prayers. Not a Traditionalist, <laughs> And no one a message fashion is successful because we have been working with them in the past.
Apologies for muting. I did uh, how that happened. Sorry, but um, as Aminia said, you can watch it uh, again on their YouTube. Apologies. For that. Okay. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, yes, the, the the video there was a bit of a delay, as Aminia has explained. Um, but then it is available for you to to watch on YouTube and at the links that have been provided in the chat. So if you're interested in seeing it again and again, we hope <laughs> please check out the links in the in the tab. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen now so that I can briefly talk about the preliminary findings that we had from this end of the, the project. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to first give a brief background on um, the Mental Health Act in Ghana, or generally about the project and why we were interested in this um, part of, of or this type of project. Um, for those who are not aware, Ghana quite recently in 2012 introduced a new Mental Health Act. Um, after decades, I should say, of negotiations and discussions and and maybe a lot of wrangling and in Parliament, we finally got, managed to get a new Mental Health Act passed in 2012, which um, among other things was looking at ways to scale up and to improve mental health care across the country in, in different ways. And one of the things that was um, expected or provided for through the act was the establishment of a mental health authority, which would be responsible for mental health activities in the country, um, including um, regulation, including training and all those other kinds of things. So um, one aspect of the work that the authority does is to work together with non-biomedical practitioners. Um, for instance, section three of the act talks about collaborating with the traditional and alternative medicine council so that they could provide optimum care or ensure the best um, interest of persons who are living with mental health experiences. So the mental health authority has been committed to working with what we loosely would term traditional healers. It encompasses a number of kinds of healers, but um, generally we tend to talk about them as traditional and faith-based healers. And one of the ways that they have um, started to work together with these healers is through collaborations. Now, the, the, some guidelines were developed for traditional and faith-based healers and how their work could, um, could fit into the expectations or the provisions of the new act. And in particular, things like ensuring that there are, um, there's an, a minimization and eventual absence of, of human rights abuses for people who seek care in alternative health places, including the biomedical, but also in alternative health healthcare um, facilities. They're committed to, to ensuring that those kinds of human rights abuses are reduced. Um, before this new act, there was quite a, very little regulation of the work of, of non-biomedical healers. It was difficult to sort of streamline or integrate what they were doing. So the Mental Health Authority has been interested in formalizing the work of the authority in, in, co in collaboration with the traditional and alternative medicine council, but also in providing guidelines for best practice. And one of the ways they, <clears throat> they try to work together with them is through using a register of activities when um, the nurses go out there. So there's a collaboration between Formal mental health workers and traditional and alternative um, healthcare providers in, in the different regions. Just to give a little bit of background about the research setting where the filming was done, 
we filmed in the Bono East region of Ghana. Sorry, I should have provided a map. I, it didn't occur to me that some people may not know where that is, but it's located in the center of the country, almost almost smack in the center of Ghana. Um, we went, we worked with the, the teams in two of the municipalities, the Inkwanza South Municipal um, Mental Health Unit and then the Tichiman Polyclinic, the mental health units that worked over there. So these two teams were the ones that we worked with for them and they showed us what their activities have been like in terms of the collaboration that they have with the healers. Um, an, an aspect of the, the background of the research setting that is important to note is that there are very few mental health professionals in that region. It is, it is uh, the case in much of the country, much of Ghana, um, but for this particular re region, for instance, uh, one of our participants explained to us that the ratio of mental health professionals to um, the population is one person to 120,000 in the population. So there's a real Dani, the, the numbers are, are large um, or they are few rather, the number of professionals are few and they do not have a dedicated psychiatrist at the moment. There are some um, uh, physician assistants in psychiatry quite recently. There are of course mental health nurses and community mental health officers and other kinds of professionals, but the, the needs versus what is available, there's still quite a large margin. And so they have been distributed at, in various health centers within the communities in those districts or in those municipalities in order to um, serve small, smaller clusters of communities throughout the municipality or throughout the district. These uh, mental health nurses or the workers, the mental health community mental health workers are the ones who are largely responsible for starting up, negotiating and building on or strengthening the collaboration with the non-biomedical providers. So we have seen um, collaboration with Pentecostal churches and then also traditional shrines with the healers who provide mental health services in these places. Okay, so what does collaboration actually look like for them? Um, we've clustered them in, in four big groups. The first one we could look at is what we have termed home visits. And in, by home visits, we mean that for a number of people who come to these healing centers or what we call prayer camps, um, the, the space that becomes a home, so to speak, for them. And therefore the, the mental health workers go there in the same way they would do regular home visits in, in individuals' homes. They go to the camps to visit the patients at the camps, to check on them and to do, sometimes they go there to do assessments when there's somebody new who has come and the, some of the healers would call on them to come and do an assessment of the new um, service either or the patient who has come there and is requiring help. They would do an assessment and, and make recommendations for the treatment. They also go there to provide medication. And um, when these assessments are done, a lot of the time they, are, they, they come for people who are not able to afford medication or afford the healthcare. And so most of the time when the, the health workers go to these um, prayer centers or on these home visits, they provide some medication and other support for them. They are also the ones who often would do some mediation with the healers in terms of minimizing the use of chains, in terms of encouraging um, the absence or um, minimizing their use of forced fasting and things like that. They do a lot of mediation, even with families who or, or caregivers who are at the camps with their, their loved ones. They would also do some, um, they, they may sometimes do some mediation with difficult family relationships as well. And the second broad theme is looking at the church clinics. As we saw in one of the videos, many of the, the um, the, the health workers, the teams go to the clinics, to the churches and organize mini um, clinics where they give talks, they educate healers or they educate caregivers. They provide a, a space for a support group sort of um, um, system where people can talk about their, their troubles or their issues or their, and, and encourage each other. And when they go there, they review patients, they check on adherence to medication, they check on any potential side effects, you know, they look at what, whether or not their medication supply is okay and all of those things. So they review patients at the camps and during these clinics, they, they, they may do even some physiological checks as well, not just for mental health. As we saw in the video, um, they would check things like their blood pressure and their blood sugar and things like that, just to be sure that the, the 
the people who are living in these camps and seeking help from these areas, they also benefit from a biomedical um, intervention, even if they do not come directly to the health center. Now, the third theme is the community outreach work that the health workers do. They give a lot of talks. They do a lot of education in schools, in churches, at radio stations. They do a lot of interventions in terms of, um, or they do a lot of education in terms of raising awareness about mental health conditions, about treatments, about care, and all of those things. Um, and a big aspect of their work is also fundraising. Fundraising. Um, as you can see in the picture here, this is a, the, the picture up here at the top here is a picture of some of the nurses who had gone and solicited not just funds, but also items to provide bedding, to provide clothing, to provide all sorts of materials that um, some of their clients may require and are not able to afford. Um, employment issues are a big problem with certain um, classes of people who have lived experience of mental illness. And so the, these health workers fill a certain gap by helping them um, to, to, to settle a bit after when they are in recovery by mediating with family members to help them to um, start a business or to go to school or whatever it is that the person desires or requires. The mental health nurses do a lot of outreach within these communities to teach and to encourage people to show, um, to help out or support their loved ones. And the last aspect is referrals. Um, the, the healers refer um, people who come to their centers to the health workers. Um, as one of the healers said in the video that we watched, when the person arrives, one of the first things they do is to ask them to see, to go to the health center to see the, the nurses. Um, many of these people come from communities, not necessarily in, where the prayer camp or the healing center is located. They may have traveled from other places to come and seek help there. So when they get there, the healers that um, our health workers have partnered with would send them to the health center to get an assessment done properly. And um, because of the collaboration that has been built, to a large extent, many of them would also then continue to monitor the treatment that has been prescribed by them um, from the health center. And then on the other way, when they're on their way out, the healers that we were able to see, some of them would send the, the clients back to the health center to let them know that they were leaving, to let them know that they're in recovery. And then the health workers or the nurses to the communities where they came from initially. So the referrals from the healers to them, and when they are on their way back as well, they refer to other facilities which are closer to the patient's communities. Okay, now the third thing I want to discuss is what makes this collaboration so successful. The very first thing obviously is the commitment, the passion, and the persistence of the teams that we saw. They have been so persistent, so committed to making sure that they, they work together with the healers to ensure that the, the patient's outcomes are better. Um, many of them told us about having to go multiple times. You go there, you start building the rapport, you go, you make friends with them, you go, you explain things. So you, you need to go there often, you need to be persistent and committed to building that relationship. And when, when the healers, feel that you respect them and you respect their authority. You are not there to condemn what they do because from what we have heard in other places, the, the previous history is that many healers feel as though biomedical sciences look down upon them or they disparage their practices. And therefore some of them may be a bit resistant at the beginning, but we've seen a team that has been very committed and has persisted in going on, over and over again to ensure this um, discussion or this collaboration happens. They, they have gotten institutional support, support from what we saw in the film. Some of them have gotten institutional support from the municipal health directorate and those things help to make the journey a bit easier. And the other side of it is the attitude of, of, and of seeing themselves as partners with healers. When the healers and health workers saw themselves as partners, it meant that they looked at it as a mutual beneficial um, um, relationship. And therefore one of the, the quotes for instance says that whatever I do will be to your glory as well. And so they are not there, they, they emphasize that they are not there to take over anything or take anything from anyone, but to work together with them. 
Now, just briefly about, I, I'm, I'm going to skip these two because of the timing, but just briefly about the challenges that some of them have experienced. Um, the big one is about resources. Uh, mental health is still not a big priority in most of our contexts, and therefore resources are very scarce in terms of um, supporting the work that the mental health workers do. It is getting better, but it's not where we need it to be quite yet. So there are very limited funds. And um, some of the communities that our, our health workers need to work at or to, they need to travel to, they are quite far, the roads are bad, or sometimes they need to travel in the middle of the night when there's an emergency situation. And if they do not have access to vehicles, even motorbikes where for some people are difficult to come by in some communities. And so the resource limitations is a big problem. Sometimes they're able to access these places, but then the supply of medication is also a problem. When the mental health, the medical stores do not provide medications that they can give to clients, then even when they're able to get to them, they are not able to support them with the medications that they need. So resources are very much still a problem Although we are seeing some transformation, um, it, well, each time there's something better, but we are not quite where we need to be yet. One of the other things was the suspicion about intentions when they are building up their collaboration. Um, as I've said before, some of the healers have a history of being disparaged or being disrespected in their views by, by biomedical practitioners. And so they are not so eager to collaborate with people when they feel as though they would not be um, treated properly. But our, our participants always constantly emphasize being respectful, making sure that you show them the, the due respect and authority that they, they hold within the community or within that space that they're in. And then that um, helps to smoothen the path for the collaborations to take hold. Then lastly, it's the challenging, the, the, fact, the issue of challenging the use of chains. Um, we see them negotiating with the healers not to use the chains and all. But one of the big problems with that is, again, limited resources. We do not have many inpatient facilities or inpatient spaces within um, many of the regions in Ghana. And therefore, when people go to the healing centers and the, um, the, the mental health nurses are negotiating for care, for better care, it is also within a space of recognizing that there are limits on what they can actually provide. And therefore, sometimes they may need to be um, a bit more, more creative in the ways that they can um, negotiate the use of, of things like change. In as much as they disagree with it, it has to be a careful process because when, when the other side of the, the matter is brought to them, there's um, very little that they are able to do for a large number of people. So these are some of the challenges that the, our participants um, shared with us or some of the things that we identified while we were following them for this film. But generally we found this team, these two teams to be um, such committed and dedicated teams that they think so much outside of the box on ways in which they can make the lives of their, their participants, their clients and the healers better and how they can work much better with them despite the limitations that they've experienced. So in terms of next steps, I know Esla will talk a little bit more about the institutions and stuff, but we are looking to do the participatory videos if COVID allows us. And then we'll also be doing some more dissemination with the, the videos, the final cuts of the videos. Thank you so much for being here with us and for your time. And um, we hope you enjoy this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lily uh, and Ursula. <clears throat> so I think it's now time to uh, for question and answers. I, uh, of course, there are a lot of things and inspiration that come out from the two presentations. So I maybe expect that uh, people are uh, asking for questions and, and also uh, I will uh, ask the presenters to reply and including uh, the, the whole team. So uh, if there is some questions, we can start. We, I think we have no more than a quarter because we are running out of time. Unfortunately, there are some delays. So maybe Wulan has some uh, collected some questions. Uh, in, in the meanwhile, I can, I can start very quickly because I think it's, uh, it's uh, an enormous amount of uh, uh, questions that have been raised by 
for, uh, for me, uh, for the first one is that uh, the simplistic view that uh, uh, task shifting is the usual way of describing the problem of resources in low and medium income countries, particularly in low income countries. But I think this is much more uh, than task shifting. This is about integrating and creating a system uh, which includes uh, uh, different several components. Um, so I think it's uh, uh, it's an issue of not just of integration, but negotiation and mediation, recognition of uh, uh, the resources which are provided by the community and the culture. So what is the relationship uh, between the individuals and the community? And uh, in your opinion, uh, what can be the role of the culture, including religion, uh, as opposed to medical knowledge somehow. So I think these are the, seems to me to be the two poles. One, the individuals, uh, uh, and sometimes individuals are, are powerless, they are disempowered, uh, as usual in psychiatry, <laughs> in Western countries too, particularly in the age of the asylums. Uh, today, maybe a little bit less, just a little bit. Uh, so the issue of empowerment is one of those and the relationship between individuals and communities, because in this interaction, there will be a lot of the problems related to uh, psychiatry, madness uh, and recovery. So uh, I think these are some of the questions for me. So, <laughs> and uh, more <laughs> beyond, the, beyond that, the production of meaning in this action, which is another important issue. So I don't know if Arminia, maybe, or Ursula, or uh, Diana would like to comment, or Lily. <clears throat> Lily, I wonder if you'd like to say something about the Ghanaian context, perhaps, in response to that. Yes, OK. Um, yeah, thank you so much for those questions, Roberto. And it's it's a lot to think about, definitely. And as you mentioned, I think there is no one like neat, um, one size fits all kind of approach that, from what we are seeing or what we are experiencing. Um, and and what we are finding in Ghana also is that the what is expected to be the case and what happens on the ground make such a big difference to the actual experiences that people have, both on the side of the service users and the, and the service providers. And in as much as there are strides being made, we're still seeing situations where the health workers would have to, to sort of put themselves into the, the mix um, in order to be able to provide some care or some, um, some intervention based on, on the resources that they have available. Um, it, it makes it sometimes difficult to, to uh, what's the word, uh, to, to sort of streamline what the actual situation is. And I think maybe that's some of the difficulties that we've, we have had, at least from my um, experience here in, is about what is the, the right way or right approach, which, which then considers everybody's perspectives. I, I, I find that within the settings, if, if considering what we have seen with the, the groups that we've worked with, allowing the, the teams to also have a, a voice, so to speak, or to, to share in the, in the production of what their needs are, uh, the, letting them also determine how they can fit into what their so-called national policy or national ideas about access and about um, services are, is important from what, what I have seen. Um, within those communities, the, the, their approaches were slightly different, but then they, they seem to achieve the same end because they had taken charge of what needed to be done and we're approaching it in that way. Um, I don't know whether I'm, I've answered the question. There's still quite a lot to sort of digest from your questions, but these are some of my initial thoughts. Yeah. Thank you very I don't much. know whether Ursula can chip in. <laughs> Other comments? A lot, Lily. Um, can I, sorry, uh, sorry, Roberto, yeah. Uh, I suppose I, I think the other the the quest the very important new question you asked, which is about um, the question of um, disempowerment, and um, I think that's that's still um, very much a, 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 an 
a, a relevant issue, I would, I would say, in relation to how decisions get made around uh, where people um, receive care, how that care is carried out. And, and yes, I think the, um, in our research, it was very clear that, a lot, that really the, the individual who was affected by the mental health condition was the, had the, 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 the least status in making those kind of decisions that predominantly families and healers um, and so that's that I think it's still something that very much um, needs to be taken forward and that I will be mentioning in my presentation. But yeah, thanks a lot for those really helpful comments and questions. Thank you. OK, there is a, a question from the public, I think, is, which is about uh, how the team will do the dissemination of the study result. Uh, I think this is a, a key issue. Who would like to reply? I, I can start maybe. So the, the um, as, as I was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there is different kind of uh, outputs of the project and they all will be disseminated quite differently. Uh, some of them will be through uh, you know, film festivals where we're hoping to go and conferences and more traditional you know, lectures and seminars. But what we're hoping is to do a lot of community kind of based work as well. So uh, we were said, planning to go back to Ghana and now because of COVID, we will be going to Ghana later and that also will mean that we hopefully will be able to do more community-based um, screening as well directly in the country as well as in Indonesia. Uh, hopefully uh, in uh, July we're organizing an event in, in, uh, in Indonesia. I try to bring together actually some of the healers and the, the mental health professionals we'll be working with to be together, some of them in a place and be able to discuss together, to be able to encounter each other, but also be able then to go back to Indonesia in the, the field sites and uh, presenting um, what what we found uh, back to the community, um, but also that what that was, and, and also I was going to be talking shortly about the implication of the study. So obviously we realize there is different audiences we need to be able to reach to be able to see the changes we want to see. And I mean, I, I'm a, a teacher, as many of you probably are, so I know the study starting from university after this presentation, Lily and I are doing a talk to my students in psychology in London about politics and identity, try to see psychology as a discipline, which also has a political role. And what actually is a role as an activist. So I think sometimes to be able to also start in schools at any, every level to see people, I mean, understand people, we all are part of change. We are all social um, agent of change and we can make these changes ourselves. And try to bring that kind of a knowledge at every level. I, I, I work in my knees with a teenager and now with our students later on. And so try to take some of the learning to the, stu to the students in many different kinds of mental health disciplines and, and also outside of mental health. I think it's a very key role about to be able to implement some of these changes and policy. So we want to reach, of course, the policy makers and stakeholders who make decision. And where you're saying, where usually people who have mental health issues are seen in a passive role to be able to actually um, give a much more active role in terms of sharing the learnings, sharing what we have learned through the fantastic mental health professionals and healers we've been working with and taking these changes where um, this knowledge where then decisions are, are be taken. These are some of the ideas, but I think Ursula, because we're going to be talking shortly about implications of the study, and we'll be prompting you all to give us an idea about what can you do to that to help us to implement these changes, and what can we all learn from you in terms of thinking beyond what you're already planning now. And we really see the title of our project is Together for Mental Health for a Reason. And we mean together, we don't mean only our team. We are very, we are very solid, very solid team. We have a fantastic, as mentioned, advisory groups, um, steering committee, participants participants, some of them actually in the project are still now in the chat with us. So we are already a big group, but we want to be expanding and making the kind of changes we need to make. So we want to be in this together with all of you and the people you are connected to. So help us to be able to make these changes. Thank you maybe, very much. Yeah. yeah, maybe I add a bit, uh, yeah. yeah, as well as, uh, uh, yeah. in. It's, uh, we are in the Center for Public Mental Health. Uh, advocacy is our middle name. So we will do <laughs> lots of things to uh, disseminate this. But the purpose uh, is the main goal is the advocacy to introduce how to empower the uh, faith based uh, healer, traditional healer in the mental health system in Indonesia. And we will 
the uh, planning is that we will have a summer course dedicated. So we are actually having summer course regularly yearly, but we plan next year to have a dedicated one uh, series uh, regarding this. And we do hope that we can make the uh, people from the minister, from the Ministry of Health, or from the uh, government, uh, sitting together with the uh, spiritual healer. Uh, so, uh, what we do will can be discussed uh, directly in that kind of uh, event. That's the biggest one. But the other thing is, yeah, we 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 disseminate through our student, through our webinar, yeah, things like like that and we learn from our uh, research uh, that basically most of Indonesian are spiritual so basically if we are empowering spiritual healer it will be very strategic uh, way to address mental health issues thank you Roberto thank you. No, I also thank wanted you. to chip in that um, we, we've also started looking at I, I bet Ursula may talk about it briefly about how to use the film in what we are talking what we are calling community conversation around mental health and so going to communities around the country um, to discuss what what the findings are from the film and using that to initiate a conversation about what their mental health situation is, what, what, what could be done differently, what are their experiences or their perspectives on what um, you know, mental health processes are in the country. So looking at, we are, we, are, we are hoping to use that as a way of taking it out of only the academic space, because um, in much of the rural parts of Ghana, there may not be people who can access uh, YouTube videos on the film and things like that. So we are looking at how we can get to them as well to get some interaction or some um, feedback from that as well. Thank you very much. I think, uh, okay, someone raised the hand. So I think it's, we are going more and more into a, an issue of complexity. <laughs> so I think for all of us, including starting from me, <laughs> we are just starting to want the very basic issues. What is mental health care? <laughs> what does it mean to have a recovery? Uh, what, is, what is a treatment so uh, uh, so this is very much uh, important to recognize how how the complexity can be raised by these views that go really into the, the culture of communities rather than overimposing uh, a, a medical model or uh, a global globalized approach to mental health care which is one of the critical points for the global mental health movement so it, which is not just applying for instance mental health gap but mental health gap is one of the tools of the many many tools that are useful to create a program for that particular individual which requires a lot of other ingredients uh, related to his social context cultural context community etc so uh, I think about the questions, uh, maybe someone raised their, their hand. I don't know who would like yeah. to... Yeah, yeah. Okay. there was, um, I think, uh, Stephen, uh, I, I do actually know this person. <laughs> so Stephen, do you want to ask your question? Open the microphone, please. or type in the chat as well. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I finally got it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to... Uh, thanks, thanks very, very much for the presentation. It's quite... I find it quite full and quite comprehensive, and thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Steve. I actually work as a as a social worker and an approved mental health professional in London, and I've been doing so for many years. And I, my understanding from both presentations is that looking at collaboration from a least restrictive pers uh, perspective and the partnerships that you actually form with informal carers and uh, traditional healers, and also primary health uh, uh, providers. That's my understanding from both uh, pre uh, 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 presentations. 
But when you're talking that, at what stage do you find that the this form of collaboration doesn't work? Does it ever break down? Do you have to go back again and re 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 uh, reorganize your consultation or the collaboration? Or at what point do you completely disregard the collaboration? Because one of the objectives of uh, the study is actually also looking at human rights abuses, coercion, and, and restriction. I sometimes find that some of these informal uh, or secondary sort of like providers, traditional healers, may also be breaching the uh, human rights practices, the universal human rights practices. So what point do you, do this uh, collaboration becomes disentangled, disorganized, unsystematic, and not in the interest of the, the service user, the families or the community? It was all good what was presented. I saw it from a positive angle, but I didn't see the other side of it in both presentations. Yeah. Is this anything you can clarify for me? Thanks um, a lot. Yeah. Someone would like to reply to Steve? Yeah, I, I, could, um, I think. Did you want to say something, Lily? Um, yes, I could. <laughs> I could. Uh, <laughs> explain a bit more um, one of the our limitations that we do acknowledge is the fact that we did, we worked with teams that had successful collaborations in place and trying to and one of the reasons for that was because we wanted to see what it actually looked like and we did try to 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 work with some team some um uh, work health workers who were now going to establish collaborations with some healers so that we could get an idea of what it was like, but it didn't quite work out for a number of reasons um, and issues of our time, the, the time that we had available and, and a number of other things that were going on. But as I mentioned in my presentation, it took persistence from what, what the, the health workers told us. It takes persistence. And there, may, there, there were actually some people who at the time we went, they were still negotiating with, they were still working with, they were still discussing um, collaborations with. There, there was one person who eventually dropped out of the study and he was one of those that they, they considered a, a bit difficult to, to, to work with because they had been going to him and, and discussing with him and all of that. The, the, the main thing that I think the, the teams are um, careful about is to be sure that they're working on a partnership with them. Um, the, the, I, I always refer to this as a really interesting paper by a young Ghanaian who says that, whether we like it or not, people are going to them. Um, we've tried clamping them down. We've tried, we've tried demonizing what they do. We've tried, there have been a number of things that had been put in place or tried, which, which um, sought to shut them down. But the reality is that we do not have a lot of mental health professionals within the system that if these um, places were non-existent, we would be able to, um, to provide care. So the teams have been careful about negotiating with them, partnering with them, working with them in a manner that is mutually beneficial. They kept emphasizing that we do not need to, to sideline them. We just want to work with them so that we can then minimize these human rights abuses and maybe um, actually even get rid of them completely so that we can regulate better what they're doing, what they're providing for the patient. And so that we can develop a, 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 a pathway of care where even if people do prefer to go to get some aspect of spiritual kind of care, they are, which is, there, is within their rights to get, they would also not be denied other um, biomedical processes that they, they can um, access to get better as well. So it's about forming that link, forming that partnership and making sure that we're working with, within the systems that people choose to go to and making sure that it is working properly and not abusing any, anybody, um, human rights. It isn't perfect yet, as we said, it is fairly new. Um, th this, this commitment by the Mental Health Authority to collaborate with, with healers is, is fairly new. And we know that there are communities where it isn't working as well as in the ones that we showed. Um, but we thought this, this, these two places that we showed at, on the Ghana side, and I, and I know it is similar in the Indonesian side as well, they showed what is actually happening. They showed the challenges as well, but they also showed what can be really good about working with these healers. 
Hey, thank you very much. I, I, I have a question about this point, sorry, before closing this, this part of our meeting. I, I suspect that uh, uh, Pasung is not a treatment, is the failure of a treatment. Uh, it's the same dynamic that can happen in Western medicine, in Western psychiatry, uh, about the use of asylums, for instance, or the use of restraint uh, in, 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 the, in the Western medicine and psychiatry. So it's uh, when you uh, conceive that uh, this problematic thing, which is uh, mental suffering or madness, can be just resolved uh, with a simplistic approach, you know, it's like a problem with a solution. But there are no solutions, no, no, not easy solutions. So it's just uh, talking about the pathway of recovery, uh, which includes a number of uh, individual and social issues, etc. So if you think in a simplistic way, uh, uh, okay, people using their their effort, like traditional healers, to cure people. But when when they are not able to cure, they use pasung as a residual of their treatment. Uh, as well as we used asylums as the residual of psychiatry in the Western world. So I think maybe it's in interesting to see how your, your first uh, results are showing that it's more important to create a more complex interaction and a network of uh, opportunities uh, uh, where, where the person can go through and, and you know, the family and the carers together. So not just a simple, a simple solution. I, I don't know if I, I, I'm wrong, <laughs> probably, but this is my impression. Okay. No if comment. I may add from an Indonesian perspective, uh, about uh, whether or not uh, a collaboration is uh, always successful or not successful. And probably repeating uh, what Lily has explained that this is uh, rather a purposive sampling method that we are trying to have uh, lessons learned from those that have collaborated in a rather more positive way. But it's also highlighting what will not work because of the absence of these uh, factors that will uh, help collaboration. And what we have found, one of the things is whether or not from these intermedical interactions from different medical healing perspectives, if there is a safe space to be vulnerable to each other in a way, to be able to talk about how, what their views are uh, in a way that is not seen as threatening to each other. And this also relates to what really works is because of uh, at the end of the day, it is also interpersonal relations that is built between all of these actors. And these sustainability is what will then uh, return again to create safe space for a longer term. And there's no feeling of threat. And, uh, and this also then relates to how they relate to the um, either clients or patients that they work with. And uh, it's, it's less transactional kind of um, interaction. It's, it's more uh, uh, like there's a, what, what some people probably call moral economy. So there's like a continuation of, of, of relationships there. I might be wrong again, uh, probably someone can add on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adi. I think it's about uh, creating micro, micro systems of care, micro, you know, holistic around uh, a single individuals. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to go on. And so I ask uh, Ursula, to uh, comment about uh, the implications of the films. And there is also a question linked maybe to that uh, uh, from the public. How can you follow the results from this and future events? Thank you, Ursula. Thank you very much, Roberto. Yeah, um, I'm going to sort of whiz through a very quick sort of presentation, really just summing up um, that what we've been talking about. And then we will have close with a discussion about how um, we can use the films and, and what next. So that will be open to everybody. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, I will not my, mute myself this time um, and just whiz through. Um, so, yeah, okay. Is, is that okay? Yes. Okay, great, thanks Lily. So, so um, yeah, so what are the implications? Um, I'm, I'm going to whiz through very, very quickly because um, this idea of collaborating with traditional healers 
um, is it has an extremely long history going back to the colonial period. And Asti and I had a very interesting conversation about the different histories between Ghana and Indonesia in terms of how this has uh, influenced these attempts at collaboration. Um, then from the colonial era moving to the, the period of transcultural psychiatry in the 50s, where there were these studies of traditional healing and the critique of psychiatric universalism. And then these early post-colonial experiments with collaboration. Um, a famous example in West Africa was Thomas Lambo uh, in Nigeria, who worked with traditional healers there. And then these attempts at regula regulation and professionalization. So we can see that a lot of these, um, these movements towards integrating traditional and faith healing into mental health care have this very long genealogy. Um, in Alma Atta, which was um, the declaration for, um, uh, in, 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 um, up around mm. primary care, um, also included this idea of integrating traditional and faith healers into providing health services at the community level. And if we look at the WHO um, traditional uh, medicine strategy, which was um, published in 2014, it's still operational. Um, this very much um, also uh, includes um, this idea of integrating traditional healing into the healthcare system. And in global mental health, this idea has again been revisited as Roberto was saying around task shifting to traditional and faith-based healers as ways of filling the treatment gap, scaling up mental health care, in terms of their sustainable development goals. Um, they also talk about harnessing the contribution um, of, 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 of traditional healers as part of meeting the, the goal for universal health coverage. And then WHO also promotes the regulation, research and integration into the health system, which is what we see very much in Ghana. They have these um, uh, guidelines and, and protocols for, for, for uh, regulating traditional and faith healers, as Lily was explaining in the mental, new Mental Health Act. And in, in uh, Indonesia, they have their free Pasung um, program. <laughs> so, um, of course, as we've mentioned, there are the ongoing human rights concerns and lest we um, um, get to, uh, um, um, you know, we don't want to overlook this as still being a, a grave concern that was recently highlighted in this Human Rights Watch report, which did, include case studies from Ghana and Indonesia. And so it does underlie, again, the importance of finding where these collaborations have worked to help reduce some of these human rights abuses. But if you look on a global scale, actually, the extent to which these collaborations are formally taking place, it's actually quite small in the WHO in the latest Mental Health Atlas. It's only 12% of countries were reporting that they were doing this form of collaboration. But um, I would suggest that under the radar, these kind of informal collaborations are probably much more widespread. But as we know, there have been a lot of critical perspectives on collaboration, uh, as um, uh, uh, Lily and others and, uh, have written about these power differentials between the different um, healers and health systems. Psychiatry is often the unmarked category, so it's supported by public health systems and global health and development. Uh, whereas traditional and faith healers are not. So education, scrutiny and regulation tends to go primarily from the health system to the healers and not the other way around. And as Roberto was hinting at, collaboration can result in the exchange of one form of coercion for another, so chemical restraint rather than physical restraint, and that is often the way that many um, health workers do work. And in the process, spiritual and ritual approaches and practices may be effaced, uh, devalued or distorted. And this is despite us knowing that these are actually very important to a lot of the people using health services themselves. So the complexity which we've hinted at and which our research clearly shows may conflict with the need for a kind of portable, scalable technique or a model that can just be uh, scaled up around the world. And um, as Anne Lovell and others have written about, there's an incommensurability at the heart of these, these collaborations between the epistemologies, the ways of knowing, and the values that are embedded in these different approaches to mental health. Another major critique has been around um, the issue of to what extent is this about people's beliefs or about people making choices, or, 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 or is it about structural violence? So is it about the fact that, as Lily was saying, there simply isn't enough 
uh, there aren't enough mental health workers, there isn't enough good quality, accessible, um, um, affordable health care. Are people using traditional faith healers to make up for deficits in health service funding? And I think certainly in the context of Ghana, there could be an argument that actually a lot of the kind of containment, confinement, restraint is being pushed onto traditional and faith healers because there are only um, three, still three um, inpatient uh, psychiatric hospitals that offer kind of crisis care. Uh, so it could be what Sen and his colleagues have called a forced pluralism resulting from inequality. But what we've seen is our research, in our research really is the pragmatics that mark these kind of um, collaborations which differ from how it's imagined in policy often. Uh, it's marked by diversity and improvisation rather than standardization. The healers and the health workers are, are both working with very limited resources often and without any supervision or, or, or support. So in times of crisis, they face these very difficult ethical decisions and have to negotiate these, these conflicting imperatives between duty and care. And, um, Traditional and faith healers are often, in these cases, the only available resource when crisis comes. And as we've mentioned throughout this, 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 uh, this afternoon, healers and health workers are members of the same community. They share a religious and a spiritual worldview. And uh, that was very clearly articulated by the nurses that we were working with. And collaboration is worked out through and within these relationships and it's relationships that are so crucial to making these collaborations work and negotiating around status and authority. So the, 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 the success is, is, is measured through the quality and endurance of these relationships over time. So the recommendations that come from this could be about strengthening communities and working for systemic change. So I've been very much inspired by the rapporteur that recently, um, uh, um, he just recently left post, Dinas Puras, who's written about the, 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 who's the who was the um, UN rapporteur on the right, right to health. And so strengthening communities and working for systemic change means paying greater attention to the sociality of lived experience of mental health conditions, healing and recovery, and opening up these safe spaces, as someone was mentioning, as uh, Asti was mentioning, for open and mutually respectful dialogue between people with lived experience, families, healers and health workers, on valued forms of care. So what they what, what is valued by people with lived experience of mental health um, problems and their families? And that may include planning for um, how to respond uh, to a crisis. So in the UK, for example, um, this idea of um, advanced directives has been one way that people have, have been able to state their preferences before uh, in case of a crisis and, and what kind of care they want. So moving more from an educational approach to engagement with pluralistic perspectives on mental health, distress and extraordinary experience. So not just about what we can teach you, but what we can learn together from all our different perspectives. And not just about health systems strengthening, which we hear a lot about, but strengthening social systems and communities. And taking this human rights approach, so not just focusing on coercion and restraint, which is often the focus of, um, of, of human rights initiatives, such as the, uh, as in the human rights rep uh, report, uh, human rights watch report, but also seeing human rights more broadly as being about addressing the social and structural sources of oppression, exclusion and inequality. And we would argue that real change can't really happen at the micro level um, between healers and health workers and families without this more systemic change to address these, these inequalities. So, um, so that's all I really wanted to say. Um, thank you ever so much to everyone for listening. And as we were saying, we, um, I think somebody might have their microphone on or there's an echo I can hear. But um, um, we wanted to move on to thinking about what suggestions people might have for how we could use the film. And I do believe that Wulan, who's our marvelous tech whiz in Indonesia, has um, set up a poll to just take some ideas. Um, so I'm just going to, so we wanted to know how um, you think you might use the film. Obviously, when we wrote our research proposal, we uh, made some suggestions about how we thought the films could be used um, for teaching and for training. 
So um, I think Wulan, um, they can just copy this link and use this or, uh, and use the code to access the poll. Is that right? Are you there, Wulan? I think you just need to go to menti.com yeah, and then so enter the code. Yeah. 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 It's all provided in the chat yes. box. Please refer to the chat box. Yeah. So um, for teaching, for training health workers, for training healers to discuss with families, or you may have other ideas, please do write any ideas and suggestions in the chat box um, about how you think uh, the films could be used and how they might be useful to you. Um, Okay, so some people have, have already responded, amazing. We, I mean, as Lily was saying, I think um, we very much, uh, we're very keen that these films don't just remain in academic circles. Uh, we don't just want this to be an academic exercise. The whole idea behind uh, doing it in a film format was that we get over some of the challenges of language, um, and of accessibility to the findings. So the Ghanaian film, for example, we want to make sure that it's available in, in different Ghanaian languages um, through doing voiceover on the films. And I know in Indonesia, there's also um, many different languages that we would like these, the films to be available. So discussing with families, using for teaching. Okay, great. Training health workers, training healers. So the... Um, so you can keep going with that, I think. And in the interest of time, I will move on. Can we have two questions going at the same time, Wulan? Is that possible? Can we maybe ask people who are write, writing other if they can uh, uh, text? It's very important for us to also think what you said beyond what we already are thinking. So it's important to see how else yeah. we can use. So people who are thinking also other platforms, other than those for one, um, if you can write in the chat, please. Yes. Yes, yeah, please. So Samba Bayou has raised his hand. Do you, do you want to say something, Samba? No? Or is that a mistake? <laughs> anyway, if, and if you have any suggestions, please do write in the chat box. Um, So great, teaching, discuss with families. So it's great that so many people think they might be able to use the film with families. That's really good to hear. Yes, and uh, we are receiving also uh, other comments from the chat. Uh -huh. uh, someone said, uh, I think there should be a multifaceted approach family healthcare workers and faith healers as there needs to be an open discussion and also sharing with um, colleagues online. Uh, it can be adapted into local languages and used as a way of empowering families through various media. Also dialogue across contexts and countries and to generate new, new research questions. Yeah, there are some. Yeah. We dialogue across contexts and countries. Yeah. Yeah. And we very, I mean, as Armenia was saying, one of our, our, our real aims, and, and um, it's just wonderful to see these conversations growing between Indonesia and Ghana. Um, and that um, getting those conversations going across countries in the global south rather than being mediated by the global north is, is, is one of the the legacies that we hope will come from the research. Lovely to see all the chats, yes. Amankwa, thank you. Yeah, it's just great to see everybody. Else. We've got people here from Ghana. I, we've been um, chatting away to our nurses who are in the film uh, in Ghana on the chat, which is just wonderful to see. Um, so um, it's really great. So uh, the second question which we asked was, um, could we put that up? Will I? Is that possible? Yes, I will. Just a moment. Thank you very much. Uh, where is it? So one of the, while well, William's putting this up, one of the, the things that we suggested was that we were going to, well, we will be developing a screening guide, um, which will be um, developed for each of, for Ghana and for Indonesia. Um, 
to to use when uh, which will accompany the film so you it will be freely available for you to use uh, when you're showing the films um, and so we wanted to know what ideas you might have to include in the in the screening guide um, so that, that that print is so small I can't actually what's what's number the red bar I can't actually see that the red is the information on the different healing approaches okay and the pink one is background on collaboration between traditional and faith healers okay great excellent and the green one is the case studies on people using healing centers yeah and we hope that um the participatory videos um um um, all being well, we hope we can still make them in Ghana as well, and they will they will be um, excellent as kind of examples from sort of amplifying more the voices of people with lived experience of mental health conditions who've received, you know, who've used these healers. Um, in the larger films, uh, um, there are there's more conversations with families and and people using the healers as well. So our final, um, we are very much hoping that the final cuts will be ready early in the new year. Uh, and we will keep everyone posted about the, 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 the launch. And we hope there will be some in-country launches as well, uh, as well as an online launch. So I thank you everybody for participating in those polls and, and giving us your suggestions. And once again, anything, right, please do write in the box. Please email. Um, We'd love to hear from you if you have suggestions um, uh, of how, how we could use the films and, and what you would like us to put in the screening guide and anything else, we're always welcome. Uh, we also always, um, uh, it would be very good to hear your contributions and ideas. So I think I can, I can hand over now back to Roberto. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Ursula, you. I think this was also fantastic to see uh, this growing live. <laughs> okay, I think we are going to close this meeting. I, I would like just to <clears throat> comment that uh, uh, this was a great opportunity for me and I think for the audience. Uh, uh, I, I remember some of the words that uh, I, uh, I heard in the, in the movies. For instance, uh, someone said, uh, we need a medium between the spiritual and the medical. Uh, I think this is one of the key issue or uh, talking people as brother and sister. So the very important uh, uh, role of self-help or people, mutual help between people. Uh, and also it's very strange sometimes, you know, but uh, of course with the, the highest respect for cultural diversity, but uh, the idea that people with mental health problems can have to face with previous sins or mistakes, this is another uh, sentence in the movie, in the first movie, it was very common before the, uh, 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 the, 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 the birth of psychiatry, but still is uh, embedded in psychiatry. So the so-called moral treatment at the beginning of psychiatry was established by, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the UK by Tuke and then uh, later on by, uh, in France, uh, uh, by Pinel and, Esquirol and others was related to the idea that people with mental health problems as something uh, wrong in their lives. Uh, of course, this was a, a moral judgment. We cannot accept it uh, anymore today, but it's still very important to find the meaning and medical model don't provide meaning per se. They need to be complemented by a more complex view, particularly taking for a multidisciplinary approach and also using some very simple words. I heard the importance here of relationships, also from the presentation of Ursula. So how is important negotiation, uh, sociality, uh, dialogue, open dialogue particularly, and, and the shift from educational approach to engagement of people and communities and strengthening social systems. I think these are all words that can perfectly fit in Western crisis in the, in the crisis of Western psychiatry today. Uh, I think we need that. We try to establish 
in some experience in community-based uh, mental health care, like my personal experience in Trieste with the group of Franco Basaglia, Rotelli and others, uh, we try to, to use this very simple human means, not just to rely on uh, complicated technologies uh, provided by the medical knowledge, but uh, just to work with the communities and using their resources, and particularly to combine their resources with the resources of the individuals. I think this is very much transcultural. This is not just related to a uh, uh, diverse uh, 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 context that we don't know very much as, as, as people living in so-called high-income countries. So I think we need to recognize that this research is rising uh, more, uh, many more, many more questions than those that can re maybe resolve. But this is a, these are very good news. These are very good news. So, thank you very much. I leave to Armenia for a final uh, greetings to all people and uh, Ursula and the whole group. Thank you very much for me. I think that's a beautiful note on which to close this gathering. So I, I will leave uh, to the uh, GM to actually do the final closing goodbye as they host in the event. But again, my thanks to all of you and we hope to um, see you again soon in our, in our next event. We'll have the release, online release for the Indonesian and the uh, Ghana films. And as we were just chatting with our uh, some of our people in the film, uh, in, the, in those events, we also would like to invite some of the people in the films, in the research to actually be part of the discussion. As we say that this is a collaborative project and the collaboration goes well beyond the, the months spent in the field work. And this is an important relationship we, we hope to continue building. And and uh, so hopefully we can meet, you can meet them, some of the people who are uh, able and willing to participate in the next event. So you can actually ask them a direct question and also ask updates about their amazing jobs in the, in the, and difficult jobs they're doing in their own countries. Uh, so please follow us in our social media, in our uh, blog, uh, YouTube, and be part of the conversation. We're very important. They keep giving us advice. We are very open to advice uh, and, and uh, about how can we um, make use of what we are finding and how can we keep learning learning about this complex uh, issue, but very much timely. Um, so thank you again to all of you and, and uh, I hope to see you soon again. Bye. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Roberto and Herminia and everyone uh, involved here. Uh, and so in the spirit of engagement and relationship, uh, please uh, also uh, be in touch with us in all of the social media accounts that we have on Facebook on uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter. Uh, and Instagram and Twitter will be at together for mh And uh, we are very, very uh, much uh, inviting you all uh, for a long-term conversation about the topic. And uh, because we start this with a moment of silence, perhaps it would be good for us to take another moment of silence to reflect on our very productive conversation today. And uh, yeah. Uh, let's begin. And thank you for that moment. It's been lovely having you all in this uh, platform. And of course, you all have the link to um, all of the YouTube uh, and uh, Wistia uh, uh, videos. And uh, we'll see you in another event. Uh, for Together for Mental Health uh, in Indonesia, Ghana, and UK. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Roberto, so much for your fantastic chatting. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah. Thank you, Anna, for coming. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice to see some faces. Nice to meet her. Nice to see some coming. known faces. Everyone, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>